I, I try to approach things with a, an integrity which the people I write about don't always show. Um, you know, you, so you show exactly how you know this or you don't know it. And you've really checked it and it makes it, it everything is accessible. There's no anonymous sources in the book. There's no, um, you know, Tory, Tory uh, spokespeople, Tory spokesman, you know, we all got you. And uh, but the, the, the writing of the book, um, I've had a long term interest. I wrote a book about political lying in 2005 in the aftermath of the Iraq war. And um, I also, I've always taken a keen interest in it and I've always kept a file on it, of it. And when Mr. Johnson became prime minister, um, the file just went through the roof. In, you know, Jordan Brown, Theresa May, David Cameron, it was really quite a sort of modest amount of lying. But, you know, they all get away with a bit, but this was astonishing. And then there came the moment which caused me uh, to go uh, to really, I think, crikey. Uh, and this was the, uh, there were a series of episodes, but this was the moment when I, the complicity of the mainstream press in uh, Johnson's uh, lies. And this was uh, the Mail on Sunday splash, uh, sometime I think in September, October, 2019, saying that three distinguished cabinet ministers or former cabinet ministers, Oliver Letwin, Hilary Benn and um, Dominic Grieve, uh, were being investigated by Dining Street for collusion with foreign powers, i.e. traitors. And they were being investigated by Dining Street. Now, this appeared on the front page as a massive splash on the Mail on Sunday. It was followed up by the uh, Times. The quite a, it, was, it was fairly widely followed up. And then uh, Donald Johnson himself went on the Today programme. He was asked by, I think, Nick Robinson, he was asked on the Today programme, what about this story? He said, yes, there are, legit, there, are, there are questions to be answered. Well, he was standing it up. I then investigated. I thought, this is nonsense. It's utter nonsense. Dominic Grieve and Oliver Letwin and Hillary Benn aren't taking money from foreign powers. And, um, and so I rang up number 10 Dining Street, the, the civil service end of it, the press office. And I said, is it true there's an investigation into Oliver Letwin? And they said, no, it's absolutely no, there's no investigation. And then I rang up, um, um, I rang up uh, the cabinet office. So is there any investigation? Has there been an investigation? No, there has never been an investigation. So Downing Street and the cabinet office were completely clear when you spoke to the officials that there was no investigation. So then I rang up Glen Owen, the or the, the, the man who broke the story in the Mail on Sunday, I said, what about it? He said, oh, no, we've definitely got sources, two Dining Street sources, I think he insisted. Now, I don't, oh, he's a completely honest man. He did, I'm sure he did. So, but what he knew were they were, they were part of the political team inside Dining Street and they were spreading this disgusting smear, actually, against res, really distinguished people, that they were being investigated for being traitors to Britain. And, uh, and, and so the Sun, Mail on Sunday and other papers were, were, were passing it on and Dor Boris Johnson was giving it plenty of momentum on the Today programme. At that moment, I just felt disgusted. I felt ashamed of, uh, of political journalism. And there are plenty of other examples which I cite in this book. And I thought, no, you've got to. And I tried to write about it, as you know, Mary. Whenever I can't get a, a, something in the papers, I have a habit of <laughs> writing for open democracy and with, kind of like, with very disastrous consequences normally. And so I offered it, I tried to get, I tried to get Channel 4. Channel 4 dispatches was really interesting. I went to Channel 4 dispatches. They were very interested. Uh, they, they, they gave me a production company. We developed this treatment. Um, and then um, suddenly, mysteriously, <laughs> I have my theories. I'm not going to share them with you. But it, that, 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 that the idea of a program about Boris Johnson's lies uh, mysteriously vanished. Um, I offered it to the paper. I wrote a column for the mail that uh, <laughs> didn't happen. I offered it to the spectator. They they explained rather sweetly that um, they, they would open them. They 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 very they had very strong contacts with Dining Street. <laughs> didn't want to be owed by charges of hypocrisy. And at that point, I did the usual thing. I rang up Open Democracy. <laughs> And you edited it, you're marvellous, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, and, and in fact, maybe we should touch on here on some of the other adventures we've had over the years, uh, things that you um, have tried to publish in other, in other places that you ended up um, coming to Open Democracy to publish, because I think they all involve 
lies or mistruths or you know what we would might call misinformation now um and you know you probably can't don't have time here to go through every one but i think it actually touches on what you're talking about here which is a sort of change in our public culture or an evolution of our public culture um where mistruths half truths distortions and being caught making them doing them propagating them is is not the the serious offence and the embarrassment that it once was. So, yeah, tell us, tell us, bring us into the picture a little bit more about our adventures together, Peter. Well, he first came into contact when I um, left the Telegraph rather dramatically. Um, when I, about when we discovered they were they were being edited by HSBC um, to, and other organisations. And clearly, I think there was a sort of I was a bit worried about their relationship with China. Not that I'm, I'm not a member of the Henry Jackson Society, I don't think that China should be removed from the face of the earth. I just was a bit upset that there was, and the, the powerful commercial interests were, um, were, uh, were, uh, were, uh, were at play. And I was, again, I was, I was a huge fan of Nick Davies, David Lee's uh, former very distinguished colleague. And um, he'd written a book, uh, wonderful, Flat Earth News, absolute, devastating condemnation of uh, what had gone wrong with Street Street. And he said the one thing which hadn't gone wrong, and it was public, was that papers were still immune from commercial interests. Well, that, that, that is not, that, is, that, was, that was the one we met, Mary. Yes, I remember that. It was a rainy, um, I think it was a rainy Sunday in, in February at some point, and I came to your office and, and you told me about um, what had been going on at The Telegraph and how you'd been trying to get stories published there for a long time they were getting spiked, you didn't understand why, and finally you pieced it together that HSBC was the advertiser um, yeah, that yeah. couldn't afford to offend. Um, and I remember when you wrote your, your reasons for resigning from the Telegraph on that basis, um, it made news all over the world. Jay Rosen, who's the distinguished professor in, in, at NYU, said this is the most important thing anyone's written about journalism in a very long time. Um, and, and again, I think that coming, coming to the point about Boris and how he gets away with it, um, you know, you touched there on how uh, there are a number of, of political journalists and media outlets that don't want to damage their relationship with Downing Street or don't mm. question what they're told by Downing Street enough. Um, why do you think this has happened? Why has this evolution taken place? Uh, well, it's, it's always been the case. And actually, I was a um, political lobby correspondent for a long time. And uh, it's partly why I, under, I have an understanding of how it all works and I don't at all uh, if you've got to have your sources and your contacts Mary and um, so uh, you know you have access and, and, and you pay a pay a price for that access um, what I felt was new um, and that's always happened and it and, and it's but what it ha what became new I think with uh, the Johnson government was the Manuf the collab actual collaboration between the mainstream press and number 10 Downing Street in the creation of falsehood. Um, and that I think, that I, I had never come across where you, Downing Street puts out smears via, which are completely false of that nature via, um, uh, as regularly there was there was one episode under new labor which i looked at and i didn't like the look of at all mi6 was opposed to chris Patton was supposed to be investigated by mi6 uh, during some dining street crisis which wasn't the case and that was a very poor show someone's asked a question about the pack mentality and sort of jostling ranks of the lobby a sort of received attitude towards events towards individuals uh, that that's always been the case but do you yeah why is it that increased what you know what what's if if it has indeed you know why why is it why is it more of a phenomenon if, if you think it is um i think it's become much more partisan and in one direction um uh, there's one very interesting case in point to when i was i had a very i looked into this matter a lot. If you were, if you're a broadcast journalist, you need access to the prime minister a for information, but b to get interviews. Now, 
Um, and, and you've got to get though that in sit down interview with the PM, or you'll take a question from you at the, at the press conference. Otherwise, your your desk, as they call it, gets get starts to question you. And um, there's one at political editor. I spoke. I Beth Rigby, I think she's called at Sky, and she she'd asked at the Boris's first Boris Johnson's first press conference. Very difficult question, I think. And I think she got booed for it, actually. And Johnson didn't intervene. But anyway, that was it. She, that, and after that, uh, access was cut off. She wasn't getting interviews. And it was pretty disastrous for her career. Um, because you, you're destined. Why aren't you? And, so the, and they really use this ac control of access to control uh, the way they're reported. Uh, and they, what is, I think, new about, I know they've all done it, all, but I think it was, has been done with a, a, a new kind of ruthlessness. And I would say the fabrication of news has, is it, on a much, has proliferated. Uh, and so we now have uh, really the, the daily invention of news and the way in which they want to investigate difficult news for the government. I mean, this book I've written, The Assault on Truth, it, it says in terms, and gives a load of examples, nobody's challenged any of the examples. The Dining Street, by, by Boris Johnson is a, is a serial liar and fabricator. He, and he gets out his lies and fabrications in part through the collaboration of the press. And you know, with three weeks have passed now since my book was published, there's been not a single review in the Murdoch press, not a single review in Associated Press, not in those eight newspapers, not a single review in the Telegraph group. Um, and um, so you, you just don't, it's as if it doesn't exist. Now it's a very, it's a, it's a serious matter line, having a prime minister who habitually and systematically and structurally lies matters in a democracy, it matters in any country. Now, it's that one thing in China or in Russia, you know, Vladimir Putin or Xi, you know, they can bang on what they, they, they create fabricated news all the time, but they don't really pretend to be democracies. We are a democracy where power should be accountable. And what I, what is not merely that Johnson lies, that these lies are never, or well, very rarely called out. Yeah, and I, I want to come back to Johnson in particular, because, of course, you knew him and you worked with him for a very long time. But first of all, I wanted to sort of paint a broader picture because um, some of the you know, it's it's it was ever thus, David. Right. <laughs> I mean, you have you have investigated and exposed massive lies told by, by very senior politicians um, over a number of years, some of some of which uh, some of those stories that you, you did, people in this audience will remember some of them won't. So just run us through some of the biggest falsehoods, the biggest conspiracies, the biggest lies that other politicians have, have told before we get up to the present day and Johnson again. Well, look, I've got a lot of respect for what Peter's written because I've been through some of his footnotes and they're genuine, you know, if you trace it back to, um, <clears throat> to, to what he points to, then they are very meticulous and accurate catalogues of documented lies, so good for you. Um, but my other reaction was to be slightly surprised that you were so indignant, Peter, uh, about politicians telling lies in this way, because we both remember terrible lies that have been told by politicians in the past. One of the most sort of lively moments in my own career was about, about a quarter of a century ago, when Jonathan Aitken, mm -hmm. who was then a cabinet minister, took the Guardian to a libel court um, for, um, for exposing his own lies. And indeed, he perjured himself in front of a high court judge to such an extent that the judge was completely besotted with him. And he would have got away with it had it not been for um, the effort of a lot of, a lot of foot soldiers in the reporting game. And he went to jail. And he wasn't the only one. You'll remember Jeffrey Archer, who was uh, deputy chairman of the Tory party. He got four years, I think, for perjury. Telling huge lies is something that politicians really do tend to do uh, in, the, in this country. And uh, I had the feeling reading your book that 
what was going on was not that politicians were telling more lies than usual and that Johnson was a bigger liar than other people, but that the difference is Johnson just isn't ashamed of it anymore. There isn't that sense of, of fear that if you're exposed as a liar, you'll be made to resign, you'll be shamed by the party. Uh, Johnson tells lies like lots of politicians, but he doesn't seem to care about being found out. Well, I actually, um, I, 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 you've got a very good point there with the Aitken but the, the, and Archer, but the, the point about those their resignations uh, is in, in each case, they lied in court. Mm. So the... Um, uh, and that's why uh, that's why Aitken went to jail and Archer went to jail. They committed perjury in court. Now, what you have uh, at the moment, and you've always uh, it, it is Johnson. I'm uh, lying in, uh, or I'm going to rephrase that quite deliberately: misrepresenting, distorting, uttering falsehoods on the floor of the House of Commons, and also in, uh, endlessly in his his public speeches and interventions and press conferences. But actually, let's just concentrate on the House of Commons, which has some of the status of a court of law. And, and what is new, because I have looked at it, there, are, there were examples in the past, occasional ones of politicians lying on the floor of the House. Eden is a very famous example over the Suez invasion. Um, and, um, uh, and we all think that Maggie Thatcher lied about Westland, though we can't prove it. Um, uh, but we think she probably did, but that she got away with it because she wasn't proven to have lied. Now, what we, what is, I, I, I say this is new because I've assembled, and I've sent it, by the way, to the Speaker of the House of Commons, I've had no response, um, a list of 15 false statements made by Boris Johnson and ministers. I sent it to him three weeks ago. Now, you, you, you don't have that false statements staying on the floor of the house that is in open defiance open contemptuous defiance of the procedure of the house of commons as set out in erskine may the procedural manual it's also in total contemptuous defiance of the ministerial code now we are repeatedly having the situation and it did start when johnson came into power and it's different to what came before under may um, and under brown and under and even under blair is habitual falsehoods said shamelessly on the floor of the house. Well, the most famous case was John Profumo, of course, back in the 1960s. But he resigned, you see. Yeah. Well, I that's think that's the case. Profumo resigned, did lie on the floor of the and house. A, and God. Eden resigned. So I think that's the, the, the point stands, which is that politicians have lied and they, they, they have always lied, as, as, as um, David um, points out. Um, but there have been consequences when they have been exposed for lying, either in the court or in the House of Commons or even publicly, in a way that there doesn't seem to be to the same extent now. And I'm really curious and interested about why both of you think that is. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, you bring up the example of, of, of Trump as well and, and the culture we're, we're living in now, um, Peter. Um, but yeah, any more about any more on the why? What why has this become something that doesn't seem people people don't seem to care about people um, and, and politicians don't seem to feel shame about? Like, David, I'll come to you first, and then and then back to you, Peter. Well, I mean, <laughs> one of the functions of political lying, of course, is a demonstration that you can. It's a demonstration of power. I mean, Orwell wrote about this in 1984, really. The whole point of 1984 was that Big Brother would make you say that two and two equaled five because he had the power to do it. And we see somebody like Putin um, engaging in, 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 in shameless lying uh, about things. And what he's saying in a contemptuous way really is, I can lie and you have to put up with it. And it seems to me that Johnson and indeed Trump too, say, I can tell the most obvious lies and you have to put up with it. And this is a story about my power over you. Because what can be done if he lies to the House of Commons? You know, Peter says, uh, this is all contempt of the House, et cetera, and he's certainly contempt of the electorate. There are no consequences. He has a large majority and a contemptuous attitude. So uh, it demonstrates power, doesn't it, over us? And well, but also, David, you and I were talking about this before. The other side of it is why don't people care? 
right? Because it's an expression of power, yes, and there are no consequences, right? But 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 there would be consequences if 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 people cared. And you were talking about the difference between feeling something and being on a side and identifying with something and looking at it objectively. Well, this was the only point where I seriously took issue with Peter's book because <clears throat> the inference seemed to be that if he could document, as he does, all these terrible lies, then people would think differently. They would say, yes, I see it. He's a big liar. So, um, you know, I shan't vote for him anymore. But that's not the way politics works. The way politics works is that people want to know which side you're on. And if you're on their side, if you're one mm. of them, if you feel the same way, then they can say what they like. And this was some a truth that Donald Trump intuitively talked about when he said he could shoot people on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. He was actually, although he's a crude and clumsy person, he was intuiting something really subtle and vital about modern political life. And so, Peter, you crossed, I mean, you crossed the the one of the biggest divide, the biggest divide of, of our generation, right? You voted for Brexit and then you came out and explained why you changed your mind, which is something that very few people in this country have done either publicly or privately. Um, and, and I think it really it touches on David's point here about the way people feel that they are on a side, they're part of something, they're part of a tribe. Um, we aren't gonna talk that much about technology and social media in this discussion, but I think you could absolutely say that the, techno the technology we now live with has amplified that, has reinforced those echo chambers and those that tribalism. Um, and I'd be curious to hear both about, you know, again, why, why you came to that decision, why you, why you um, moved from one tribe to another um, or were seen to do so, um, even though you probably have kept an open and skeptical mind. Um, and, and, then, and then to David's point as well about that, that, that um, more on, on the reasons why perhaps lying doesn't have the consequence that it once did. Well, I, um, I don't really see my, I don't try not to see myself as belonging to a tribe. I think the, the job of being a journalist is rather a modest one, is trying to tell the truth. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you're not, you shouldn't belong to a tribe. And I think one of the problems is that too many um, journalists do, much too many journalists do belong uh, to tribes. Uh, and maybe it was uh, my own tribal sort of affiliations, as it were, which uh, led me to make what I now think was a mistake of, to, to vote for Brexit. Although I, I still think I have some good reasons as well as bad ones uh, for doing so. Um, I do, get, get, I think this issue which you just raised there and David was raising um, tribe, uh, is it, when I was researching the book, I came across a phrase, it, uh, I think I pinched it from an American journalist, but he sold it from social anthropology, tribal epistemology. And um, it, it, that is a, and so your, 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 your politics now becomes who you follow and it's like a football team or a, or a tribe and, and your, your side is right and the other side is wrong. Now that's disastrous. It's an attack on the public domain really, because it's, it assumes that there are no common, th it, it, it diminishes the common things which we have as a society. And we should, uh, David uh, Marquand in a wonderful book, which I influences me enormously. I really recommend it, David. It's called The Public Domain, I think. Um, it's about the public domain, all these wonderful things, public libraries, public spaces, the bar, I don't know, disinterested academic research, all kinds of things which we all have in, in common parks, um, public space, which is outside the market, and it's outside the, um, it, it, it's it's outside the state, and it's just what, who we are. And I, I uh, and what they have done, and it's not just Johnson; he was inheriting a situation which had been created for him. But what we have done or seen is the commodification of truth, and so it has become something which is instead of something which is disinterested and which we, we, we can agree uh, a common ground, it's something which is effectively being privatized and taken away from us. And I do think this is a battle which we have to fight. And I, and I really think that um, why I'm very, I hope something emerges out of this conversation because that is what we should be doing is winning back the common ground where two sides who disagree about stuff can nevertheless agree really great things too, really powerful, important things can agree about actual facts. 
Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously been the guiding ethos of open democracy, which is pluralism, right, which doesn't mean false neutrality, doesn't mean false balance. Um, it means having principles and, and values, but um, being objective um, and uh, valuing, lifting up and hearing multiple viewpoints um, on, on any one issue. So if anyone who's not signed up to our newsletter, please do. Adam will put it in the chat um, if you want to hear more, um, a, a wide and diverse uh, range of perspectives on what's happening both in the UK and globally. Um, I, 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 so I, my next question is really, what do we do? So you said we have to stand up for this shared set of facts. So how does that actually work in this, in this age, in 2021? Like, what, what can we do? Um, I think, you know, and to David's point about the fact that your book is very, very well researched, very accurate, but will it change anything? You know, what, what, what else needs to happen? Well, I have set in motion a, we can't tolerate politicians continuing to exist selling us lies um, and I therefore I do think we as citizens have a an ability to challenge them um, you know if you hear your local MP uh, lying take him call him or her to to account um, if, if, if the Prime Minister lies call him or her to account for your MP and um, you can you can uh, I think we also need to challenge the speaker. He is the speaker of the House of Commons. Uh, and I, I'm amazed. I'm, I, I, I mean, three weeks have passed since I sent him a long list of lies in the book. I do think he owes me a letter. And why, isn't it, why doesn't he mind that falsehoods have now proliferate since the moment, more or less, that he became speaker on the floor of the House of Commons? Isn't that something which should have upset him? I'm amazed that I also sent the letter to Keir Starmer. I got a very polite acknowledgement, but I want him to. I he should should use should use this as a way of bringing uh, decency to public life. I sent a letter to the prime minister, but I don't expect to reply from him. But you never know. And I I do think we need to return to the basic. Now, some people say it wasn't. I think there was a basic decency about British public life for a very very long time, and it's been deliberately and ruthlessly smashed it's not simply in the matter of truth but in the way appointments are now made you know some some Tory donor is now is plucked from nowhere with no interest in the, the arts and he suddenly becomes the chairman of the BBC or, um, uh, or what no, I, and I just don't think that's right I just think that you you due process is something which is actually a very Tory value uh, and um, uh, so I think we need to start to fight. We need to start to agitate. We should embarrass people. I've also sent this letter to the Jacob Rees-Mogg, he, leader of the House of Commons. He's absolutely fixated on correct procedure and due process. That's the whole, I've known him for 20 years, the whole point of it, really. And, and I'm looking forward to hearing from him how it, well, what he thinks about lies. But... I, I, <laughs> on the floor of the House of Commons. If I was the Tory leader of the House, I'd be appalled. Um, uh, do you have any, I mean, maybe you don't have to name them, but you know, are there Conservatives that you know, Conservatives in the House of Commons now, that you know who are concerned about this, who do, who do see it? Because I think it, any intervention would seem party political, right? It would seem political. You could get a petition, you know, open democracy, yeah. host it. We could say, this is about truth. This is, you know, this is- um, And there are some you know, things out there, which I want to look at a bit more. Yeah, but, but, but the thing is, is that it, it, then it just plays into this dynamic that we're already talking about where, you know, it's seen as tribal, it's seen as, as being anti-Tory and left, left wing or, you know, having an agenda. Dinners, and in so, fact, yeah. I mean, because I think the thing is, is that, but I'm sure there are conservatives, as you say, who are pretty concerned about this. This is, this sets a very, this is sets a very, very worrying precedent. So I wonder if you've had any, even off the record conversations with them, if you can't name people, you know, yeah. are, there, are there potential allies on that side of the aisle? I think there are, if you somebody I, I won't name that person. He sent me a text saying he bought the book, but you to reading it. But I would, um, I, I, the, there is a problem in the House of Commons, which I think that open democracy is particularly well, particularly well um, placed to address. Now, yes, we have the ministerial code, which says the, uh, that says that the minister must correct a falsehood uttered on the floor of the House of Commons uh, as soon as it, he, he, at the first opportunity. But if, they, if the prime minister went order the minister, to go and do that correction. And he, he is guilty of the majority of the 
of, of these episodes, then that's just dead at the moment. The ministerial code is now dead, not just, by the way, in terms of lying, but also in terms of all kinds of other issues to do with integrity. Um, and then we, and accountability. Uh, then we have us in May, likewise, if the Speaker of the House of Commons um, is, is not interested in, in, in enforcing that, nothing can be done. Um, there is one way they could be enforced, is the House itself could take control could insist on truth being told on the floor of the House of Commons. It, can, it could meet and, and it could punish the offenders and it could make it the law of the land. But of course, it's an 80 Tory majority uh, and they're not likely to do that. So uh, we have to look at ways of, uh, of, of uh, embarrassing MPs. I mean, one of the problems if you're a cabinet minister and uh, Mr Johnson at the moment is he often he will say a lie. I demonstrate in the book. And then it has to be repeated by Ricky Shunak, Rishi Shunak, the Chancellor. He, he, he repeats, as a on record, of repeating falsehoods, which were put out there to begin with by Mr. Johnson. Well, that does nothing to his own reputation. In the long term, I would have thought it might destroy it. I don't think you can go on lying and getting away with it, by the way. Let, let the, let's, this is the point, right? Can Johnson declare war? Right. Imagine he find out we find ourselves in a situation where he wants to send British soldiers potentially to die in a conflict. And he is known to be a profligate, cynical, shameless liar, as and people not, are, I think, do. Will anybody put in a really serious matter like life, which involves life and death? Are they going to follow him? I ask that question. I don't know. It's interesting because several people in, in the chat have, have questioned uh, why, why Blair hasn't been mentioned this. And obviously your, your point speaks to that. I mean, your, your book makes it clear that it, Blair's lying was different um, because he, he said things which were untrue, but he claims that he believed them at the time. He believed them to be true. And, and he, was not, he didn't have a reputation as a, as a massive serial liar, at least not a widespread reputation. Not not in 2003, he did. 2003, when, 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 this, when this started. So I wonder if you could explain that, because you go into this in the book, you could explain the difference um, and, and why this is distinct. Well, what, what I... It's an argument at the back of the book about philosophy of lying, which is that... And other matters. I mean, the, the, there is a long tradition on the left. I, <laughs> quite a few left wing people might disagree with this, but... Uh, that, that the end justifies the means. So that if you're, you're so virtuous, if you're if you're left wing, uh, if you're a uh, you're Rousseau or Godwin or people that think that that actually and, and your your ends are so des desirable that you're entitled to um, tell lies in order to secure them, all the more so because your conservative enemies are so venal. And, and that I sure I know that affected people who voted for Tony Blair because they would been so they'd been through the 1980s when absolutely the Tory press had been uh, had lied about Kinnock um, it was virtually impossible for Kinnock to get his message across and I think they were so scarred that they weren't going to allow that to happen again and maybe they learned the long wrong message uh, against the Tory as expressed by Burke and Oakeshott the two primary Conservative Party philosophers who uh, Conservative Party, Conservatives are very suspicious of grand schemes of change, uh, but they t uh, and they feel they might end up in disastrous places, but what they feel the opposite. Therefore, they concentrate on due process, doing, being lovely to your family, being a good member of your local community, and, not, and your personal relationships, not lying and cheating and so on. That is the two, uh, I mean, as a simplistic way of putting forward uh, the difference between left-wing and right-wing philosophy, but that's what I argue in the book. So, and what I then say, of course, is what is terrifying now is you had Trump and Johnson and various others, Modi and Putin and co, who, you, who are right wing figures, probably, but completely uh, bereft of that sense of nicety of due process of the oak shot or the buck. They just use lies as a manifestation of power. And that takes you into very dark territory as, as history shows us. Yeah, indeed. And someone just asked in the chat as well, um, is it that the, the Conservative Party that is, is no longer the Tory party that you recall, it's now a far right party that simply is focused on, on winning elections. It's very different from that Berkeley and Conservative. Yes, party. I think so. Yeah. I so, think about focusing on winning elections. I think it, is, it, it ceased to be a national party. 
the, the, the Tory party from uh, really from Peel and, uh, Dis, and, and Disraeli, I know they're opposite side, but almost claimed to represent the nation. That was the big thing. Now it does, uh, uh, and now it, it, it represents a, a group of voters. Yeah. And that's a huge difference. And that was always a claim they made against the left. The left was just a class-based party representing a section of the voters. And that's why the, they work very well at elections. But now the Tories don't really. They, they abandon voters. And they, but they were absolutely ruthless in using potentially dangerous methodologies, which were completely uh, opposed to previous Tory leaders, including Thatcher, in order to win votes. Well, and specifically, they, they, they're mainly um, aimed at voters in England, not in the United yes. Kingdom. Yeah, that's right. Um, which is a very significant point and obviously plays into, plays into the Brexit um, context as well. Um, and and in, in fact, I wanted to thread that through to you, David, because um, our good friend and my dear colleague, Adam Ramsey, if he was on this panel, would say that everything that Peter outlined before about the ways in which you can't actually get a prime minister for lying to the House of Commons, right? The, the way the procedures, the rules, the ministerial code shows a constitutional setup that's fundamentally broken, right? Where parties can govern not, not for the whole nation, but for a faction, factional interest. And, and when things go wrong, when there's lying, when there's cheating, when there's subterfuge, there, there's, there's no way of, of holding our leaders accountable um, because we have this arcane system um, that you know, ha has these ways that you can work around it. I mean, what, what would you say to that as well? And particularly, again, looking at your own career and the lies you've exposed um, over many, many years. Well, I'm a little bit surprised that Peter attributes to the left the notion that the end justifies the means, because one of the novel things that has happened in recent years is that the, the government and the Tory party appear to have been taken over by a crowd of radical, belligerent uh, right-wingers who think that the end justifies the means. And these are the people who've said, whatever it takes. You know, these are the people who, who used Downing, the Downing Street smear machine to make the most outrageous suggestions about their opponents. These are the people who see the political value in lying because they've worked out that if you tell a lie like uh, there's 350 million for the NHS every week on the side of a bus, everybody who says, but that's a big lie, simply amplifies the row and draws attention to it so that telling outrageous lies works precisely because they're lies. And that, of course, is what happened with Trump as well, who lies brazenly and revels in the uproar and the amplification caused by the lying. And these are the people, these, these mad radicals who've discovered that you can, you can lie to political effect and they think that means, uh, you know, the end justifies the means. And isn't that a new thing that we've got, not from the left, but from the right? I agree with that, David. I, I, I was point I make that really, I completely agree with every word you said there, and um, I think that's a point I was making. The book that something happened. Something has happened to the Conservative Party. It now has abandoned that nice, I'd say nice, but the old-fashioned or the traditional um, philosophical basis. It's not just on uh, on right lying. I mean, on race too. Think Burke. Think things. Think think of the things which Burke said about empire. Mm. Yeah. So I, I want to come come back to that point about empire because that I mean that that's I, I would love to 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 go go more into which institutions you know in the past in Britain did make Britain decent because I think we probably all on this panel have some very different different views on that. Um, but I wanted to first touch on the on the point about um, the oxygen or the amplification of lying because that that's that comes back to the how do you fix that problem? Do you not talk about the lying? You know, do you not do you not react to it? Um, and and then also, um, where did this come from? Um, because another thing David and I were talking about before this call is the fact that, of course, we've accepted lying or mistruths or elision of truth from those who are trying to sell us things for a very very long time in the advertising marketing industry. And actually, with digital media and with plummeting advertising revenues. Um, you know, you've seen the growth of native advertising and sponsored content, things that's supposed to look like news um, and information that are actually paid for by large companies that are trying to sell you things. So for me, there seems there seems to be a, a fairly clear through line between the sort of the mad men, the executives, the, the ad agencies right, of the 80s and, and 90s. And the fact that suddenly 
it's called something different when it's politics, right? It's called lying, it's called misinformation, it's called disinformation. It's called, called all those other things. When you look back, you know, you can see where it came from. You can see it, you can see a trajectory. So I wanted to know what either of you two thought of that point as well. Where did this come from? H how do we understand it? Well, the classic, um, classic misinformation you get from advertising is a form of association, isn't it? That you, 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 you try and break through people's rationality by saying, when you see a picture of this car, you want to think of a picture of a beautiful girl or, you know, um, something like that. You make an emotional association. And certainly that's a trick that's moved over into politics, hasn't it? And this is the point I was trying to get over, that when the emotional associations conjured up by political spinners or who come from advertising, when those emotions are so strong, uh, just saying that the people are telling lies isn't strong enough to defeat that. It's <laughs> talking about truth is a weak force. I hate to say this as a journalist all my life, but you know, to say what is the case is a weak force, but to associate something with people's strong emotions like greed or resentment or fear is a strong force. And that's what they've learned from advertising. So, so the, the goal would be to say truthful things forcefully and powerfully and make people feel things with them, <laughs> right? That's the combination you need. <laughs> Peter, make people you... have good feelings, you know, not bad feelings, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Peter, did you want to say anything on that? Yeah, it's, yeah I agree with that. But it, it's also, I think, the kind of um, new, the, 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 the technology of political manipulation has exploded in the last 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and that is a uh, terribly important thing because you that I'll give you the example that I'm uh, of the Conservative Research Department. If you go back 30 years ago, when I first became a political journalist, really distinguished people, Chris Patton was head of it, David Cameron was head of it. When I was around, David Livingston, who became, uh, you know, you know, uh, he was head of it. No, um, it, it, and I was amazed to see, and the, this is a story in The Guardian during the election campaign, that he had now become a sort of purveyor of lies. This very distinguished, sort of almost Ecole Normale Supérieure of British politics, where all the, the high flyers went, had now become just, it, it just was, was there sending out lies, falsehoods, demonstrable falsehoods, to constituencies, and that's all it did. It had lost... There's a wonderful man, you know, nobody's else heard of him, but I know Lord Lexton, he's called Alistair Cook, he was once called, he's in the House of Lords. He used to edit a book about the size of a telephone directory with, which scrutinized every Labour policy in the election campaign and, and just listed every Tory one. And it didn't contain any falsehoods. It was, it obviously gave a bit of a Tory interpretation, but it was, it was a fantastic document which you could rely on for facts. And now I look, I saw the latest thing and it's horrible. I mean, it's really awful. Uh, uh, and that is what's happened. They've lost any sense. And it's also a loss of a sense of decency, of duty. Of, I mean, it's all about winning that ghastly little political games and not about the country and about the, looking after people's lives. It's, it's just a loss, they've lost all of that. Uh, and uh, I, it's happened very fast, and I, I think I, I think it's wretched, and I think we have to win something, win it back. Something's gone horrible wrong. So thank you. That's very useful teeing up to the last discussion point, which is around decency and winning things back. Because, I mean, to my mind, when I look back at the history of Britain and particularly the British Empire, I see lots of lies or falsehoods or delusions about who we were. Um, in the world, <laughs> what we did um, to other people, um, you know, what, what we told other people, our own citizens and, and other people in the world about what we were doing at the time. And there are so many um, quaint um, phrases or terms for, for, for things that happened, opium wars, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. that, that, um, that was so misleading <laughs> about what was going on and about people, people's life and death. So um, I wanted David to, yeah, maybe if you pick up that point first and then and Peter um, next, you know, haven't we always been telling ourselves and each other falsehoods about 
what Britain is, who we are, what's decent about it, what you can trust, what you can rely on. Um, I'm not, you know, I, uh, this is not a sort of postmodern argument that nothing is true. It's, it's, it's saying, you know, do we need to take a look in the mirror um, and understand who we are a bit better and, and, and what our heritage is, I suppose. Well, it's certainly true, isn't it, that history is written by the victors. And in Britain, we've seen ourselves as the victors over the lesser races. That was the, the kind of attitude which <clears throat> justified imperialism. And of course, our version of history is in fact dramatically different from the version of history as seen from the bottom up and as seen by the, the losers of history. Um, and you may be making a case there, Mary, that all history is, is lies, if you like, or all history is interpreted. And all political narratives are lies, if you like, or, or just the way events are interpreted, you know, like uh, Peter presented, they started to present there a narrative about, oh, it's always the left that does this. And then, you know, we had a discussion. He said, well, maybe not. Uh, my narrative was a bit different there. Um, you could say that all the religions of the world consist of a set of competing narratives, none of which are probably true, literally. Um, so if you're not careful, we're going to fall into this, this abyss of saying nothing is, is really true. No, I think we're comparing two different things, actually, here. One is, part of, oh, I've tried to sort of be telling lies and falsehoods in a very direct way, a very precise way. And the grand narratives which have driven our society. And what I would say, though, is that of course we've had the great imperialists, um, you know, Milner and Rhodes and um, Clive and and other figures like that. But we've also had a, a very rich tradition on both sides of uh, the, the political divide. Because I'm a Tory, I'll point to Burke. You know, that ten ten year trial exposing the evils of the East India Company, Shaftesbury, Factory Acts, Wilberforce, ending the slave trade, etc. And then on the left, you know, it's a magnificent tradition of, um, of speaking up for working people, of bringing rights in the workplace, of the Attlee government, I, probably the most, arguably the most glorious government in British history, actually, I, which, and I, um, and what I think has happened now, and we're talking about these narratives, and this moves us on to a different discussion, is the attempt by, again, by this government to create a form of Britishness which can't be questioned. This is pretty weird, actually. They're doing two things. They're insisting on free speech on the one hand, but not allowing um, academics to draw attention to the um, undoubted horrors which British people have perpetrated around the world as well as good things. And I don't quite understand that. We're, we're a mature, sensible, decent society. We should be able to uh, absolutely be able to examine the atrocities and the horror of our past, as well as, you know, it, it, we're not, and not feel threatened by it. Thank you. Yeah, two points to pick up there. First of all, you mentioned the Attlee government, which of course um, was um, the birth of the NHS, uh, which is obviously one of the institutions that we, we all on the right and, and left cherish. And I wanted again to point to our campaign um, that's going on at the moment. We, we exposed how um, Palantir, which is a private, um, privately owned US tech firm founded by a Trump supporting billionaire, is getting a foothold on the NHS, um, being given these large lucrative contracts without scrutiny, without public debate, without consultation to process um, NHS data, which is our personal sensitive health information. Um, so Adam's gonna put a link in the chat so you can hear more about that because I think that's really, really important. One of the things, you know, you heard Peter there talking about the Attlee government and what it achieved, that was, that's the NHS. And, and that's something that's critical to what we value in this country. And, and it's critical to our future, um, particularly after what, we, 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 what we've just been through and what we're still going through as a country and, and in the world. Um, I think your second point, um, again, was, was really well made there, Peter, that there, there are things that we can look back on as inspiration moving forward um, when it comes to truth seeking and justice. And that doesn't even have to be a national story. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's something that we as journalists can hold and 
um, and, and move forward with. So again, again, this is another plug. I will say, if you think that independent media should tell the truth and um, hold power to account, then um, please support open democracy. Um, we aren't beholden to HSBC <laughs> and we're not beholden <laughs> to any political party. So we'd be grateful for your support. But I wanted to um, ask both of you to just make some concluding remarks. Um, if people take one thing away from this conversation, from this discussion today, what would you hope it is? And what would you hope if, if they do one thing differently or see one thing differently after today, what would you hope um, it would be? And I, I'll go to you first, David, to put you on the spot. Well, I, I, I think that um, um, the, the reason why people are so vulnerable to being lied to in this way is because of their level of anger and resentment and I think if we if we could find political ways of reducing the level of anger that so many people feel we'd stop them being so vulnerable to lies. Thank you thank you very much and Peter final thought that you want to leave people with or, or thing that you would hope they see differently or do differently after today. Well actually I, I have a feeling that open democracy people are, are rather splendid people I, uh, but I am um, and I don't think they could, I, I think they're almost perfect, I expect. But what I hope is, and I think we have to fight, we have to fight now, it's not so, uh, we have to fight for truth and we have to fight to bring back honesty into the public domain. We, uh, we, it's got to be, it got to matter when a politician does tell a lie uh, or, uh, and a, or a journalist. I also think that the is, I would say this to my beloved fellow journalists that our job is not to become part of some corporate cartel um, manufacturing um, dodgy news for the use of uh, if, uh, it, for, which will suit the government of the day our job is to do a very straightforward thing which is to report stuff straight and when politicians ministers and the prime minister lies to bring that to, to bring that to public attention uh, and I do think MPs, I say this to MPs as well, it is for Parliament to stop going along with this. I'm so, I, I, it, Parliament is the great place where democ British democracy happens. And at the, for the last 18 months, Parliament have been allowing the Prime Minister and senior ministers to tell lie after lie. Well, I'm going to rephrase that, falsehood and misstatement after another. And there's, there's no objection. There's no anger. It's, not, it's almost as if there's nothing wrong about it, and that surely can't go on. Thank you so much. Well, thank you to both of you, David and Peter. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion and lots of very complimentary comments in the chat. Um, this is Peter's book. Um, I highly recommend it um, and the footnotes. Um, available from all good bookstores um, and thanks for everyone for participating today please join us again next week at exactly the same time where we're going to be talking more about that NHS data case um, and have a good morning good afternoon or good, good evening depending on where you are thank you very much thank you